Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp, back for another episode of the Keto Naturopath. And today we have a rather meaty topic to cover, controversial you might say. Uh, the topic is exogenous ketones, and I put a document, put together a document, in part I do this for my own notes to have the discussion or the conversation or the broadcast be a little more coherent in the sense that it follows a line of topics that I want to cover. It can meander somewhat, but I think these are things that need to be covered, hence I write them down. So I put this, uh, my notes, in essence, in our Facebook group, and already before this podcast, there's been questions of, I'm so glad you did this. So many people have been asking me about exogenous ketones, so when do I take them? Well, <laughs> that's a, a loaded question was my response in the Facebook group, but I generally think that very few people need to take exogenous ketones. Clearly they will, because they're a novelty. They've heard so much about it. The the information, the the advertising on this is extreme in every corner of online advertising. It's just amazing. And yet, if you listen to other podcasts of pretty competent people, very competent people in the ketogenic world, like uh, Dominique Agostino and others, just names off the top of my head, you realize there's value great value in just having a doing a ketogenic diet. Or if you want to make your ketogenic diet even more ketogenic, meaning more efficient at producing ketone bodies, specifically BHP, beta-hydroxybutyrate, then you would look into MCT oils. And even more efficient of that would be C8 triglyceride, caprylic acid triglyceride, as being the most efficient by a long shot. So it's like first place and then there's not even a close second. In terms of natural, I would consider prolic acid triglyceride, which we also have a product of, of course. I'm, I won't say I'm in love with it. I find it very effective and very useful in so many different situations. But it's become more used in epilepsy to have their diet be much more effective, much more ketogenic, and allows them to have a more liberal diet in terms of the carbs. They can take more carbs. They can take more protein. So it allows one to be less constrained but you're still within the ketogenic diet. We can talk more about that kind of diet, which is called an MCT oil diet. And now the more amped up MCT oil diet is the caprylic acid or C8 MCT oil diet. More on that later as a separate topic, but just to know that I don't really think exogenous ketones are necessary. A couple of years ago when they first came out, yeah, I was eager to try them. You know, what's going to, how is it going to feel? I, I worked out and, you know, wanted, I thought it would give me hours of unending energy. It didn't have those effects. And I found it was basically just rather expensive. And when I stopped taking it, I didn't notice anything contrary to that. I think I was being so hyper self-observational that perhaps my workouts went a little better, but I'm at a loss. So unless my summary of this, and I guess I shouldn't jump to the summary before I cover all the details of today's podcast, but my summary is unless you have a very specific situation that you need to have ketones, meaning beta-hydroxybutyrate, right now in your blood because, 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 and those conditions would be you're an elite athlete. You've already trained. You're already very ketogenic. You want that boost beyond where you are and you need it for a set period of time. So there's actually studies on that. And these studies are about rowers. And they said, well, it increased, it allowed them to go 2% faster. Well, in that particular context of being an elite rower, the 2% mattered. They said it's 400 yards and whatever race it was. So that was significant for them. Others would be medical conditions that are basically unalterable, meaning they're not going to get better, but you might slow down the process of them getting worse. That would be Alzheimer's and dementia in general, uh, perhaps even Parkinson's disease. But even those conditions, and I, I say this parenthetically, I think if if they don't if their dementia is not so 
bad that they can take care of themselves, it's very easy to have a ketogenic diet. And if they are slipping into something in which they cannot take care of themselves, they cannot make their own meals, then it's very easy for their caregiver to help them maintain a ketogenic diet doing pretty much the the C8 MCT oil ketogenic diet. So I don't really ever see it's necessary, but you can play around with it. Also, as we'll find out, the costs with some of these exogenous ketones is incredibly exorbitant, <laughs> not just pricey. They're they're like Tesla next to Volkswagens. So, all right, let's get started. You know, this was this was a topic that I, oh, a month or two ago said that I was going to cover in a couple of weeks, but I really dragged my, my feet in putting this document together due to recent reviews and studies being done on exogenous ketones and having to spend time to extract out what I thought was the relevant parts, you know, and try to push aside the hype. For those in the Facebook group, you'll see the document I put together, I took about, oh, I think it's 20 exogenous ketones that are being sold on Amazon as of this particular podcast, which is February 19th. There are over 70 different exogenous ketones for sale on Amazon. And guess what? They are all made by the same company. So what do I mean? They're all white labeled. They're all wholesaled. In other words, if you go in and you find out, you know, what the product actually is, it's called uh, Go BHB. So that's amazing. So the question you would ask yourself right here, if there's 70 exogenous ketones, and we're speaking about ketone salts, and I'll explain those in detail a little bit later, but there's about 70 exogenous ketone salts sold on Amazon, and they're all the same thing. So how can they be differentiated? Well, here's the secret to Amazon. If you have a product on Amazon and you want it to do well, you're going to have to outspend everybody else on advertising. You're going to have to come up with a really pretty label that is attractive to whoever you think your audience is. And those are the two secrets. But primarily, it's you have to be savvy with advertising. So you need to know all about your keywords and so on and so forth. And you put a lot of money. So you're going to outspend. So why I say that, what does that have to do with anything that has to do with a ketogenic a naturopath? Well, these are all over the place. For the most part, they're, they're all, I should say, they aren't 100% all the same ketones. Uh, keto sports is not go BHP. So there's one exception in terms of a ketone salt, but they are all pretty much, they're all ketone salts and they're 99% uh, go BHP. So that's it. So you can choose, you basically can shop, choose the prettiest label. If that's, a, that's where your uh, discretionary tastes fall. Uh, you can look for the cheapest and you can, and they're all pretty much the same number of uh, servings, et cetera, et cetera. Being a, a physician, we have access to physician only products on a physician-only product supplement site. And it's an easy way for you to buy supplements for your clinic and so on, so you don't have to buy a ton of just one to get a good price break. So there was a product for Designs for Health, and they were exactly like all the other products on Amazon, but they're being sold to doctors as an exclusive, hey, we have the best exogenous ketone. And you look at the back, it's the same old, same old. Three flavors of ketone salts, all in the, all in the same package. So I've talked about ketone salts a little bit. The other exogenous ketone, so that was an exogenous ketone salt. The other exogenous ketone is called a ketone ester, which is actually just coming out as of this month, February of 2018. So let's back up a little bit and give a little history, okay? So when we talk about ketones, we're actually talking about ketone bodies. And ketone bodies are made by your body. And uh, only now, given these two categories of exogenous ketones, are they now made synthetically? Okay, so what are ketone bodies? Ketone bodies are acetoacetic acid and beta-hydroxybutyrate, otherwise known as BHP. Primarily, all we care about is BHP. That's what you are measuring when you do your finger prick analysis on your ketometer. And I know there's breathalyzers and so on and so forth, and they do actually measure acetone, and they try to draw a correlation with what your blood levels are relative to your breath levels of acetone. I We used to do that measurement until it broke, and I realized it was really too expensive a gizmo, and it wasn't a real specific number, so I like the ketometer, Keto Mojo. I like doing a more accurate reading on an apples-apples basis, and 
So that's what I use. I've deferred for that. So there's other ways to measure it, but I'm talking about blood ketone levels and BHB, which is technically a ketone body. People ask, are all ketone bodies the same as ketones? Technically, no. So we're just talking about BHP. These are questions that have been sent in, so I'm covering it now. We're just looking at BHP. The others are ketones, but we're not going to measure them, nor are we going to be talking about them in the foreseeable future. Are both ketones exactly the same? The question really is, are both kinds of exogenous ketones exactly the same? And I say, no. How are they different? Exogenous ketone esters, you can call them a bioidentical ketone body for BHP. So they actually figured it out in the lab, and it wasn't any quick story. Uh, they, they got a grant back in 2006. So from 2006 to 2018, that's how long it took them to come up with a synthetic bioidentical ketone body, BHP. A ketone salt is not that exactly. It is something that you take in which, and as you take, your body breaks it down into two different types of ketones. So this is an argument within the exogenous ketone world. Ketone salts are two different types. They're what they call a D-form and an L-form. So what a D-form, I'm not going to go into a lot of chemistry because I know a lot of people don't care, but now I have to explain what the D-form and the L-form is. So the D-form and the L-form are this. You hold up your two hands, you put them across from each other, and you realize they are mirror images of each other, right? So you have two hands, put your two hands in front of each other, palms facing palms, and your thumbs are up, so that's exactly a mirror image. But now you turn your palms, palms down, and you realize, well, they are just the opposite. So they are two different chiral images, if, if you like that word, uh, two different moieties. Basically, they are not the same thing. And in nature, nature doesn't make even pairs like this. So if you're looking at nature and vitamin C, it's the D form. If you're looking at, you know, primarily nature defaults to the D form of any natural product out there. So synthetically, it's a lot easier. And this is how a lot of vitamins got started, by the way. They went through a lot of phases. Is that you had racemic mixtures of synthetically made. Vitamin C was certainly one of them. Vitamin E is another, tocopherols. So you had mixed the D and the L, even though your body was not going to use the L form. So the argument is this. If you talk to people that are pro, that is, they have some sort of financial interest, financial investment in a ketone esters, which are just coming out, then they're going to say, well, you're stupid to take a ketone salt because it has a D and an L form, and we don't know what your body does with the form that it doesn't use, the L form. So now that you understand that, we're going to come back to, does that make a difference or not? I don't believe it does, but if you were to ask somebody, Dr. Veach is, you know, of the, doc, of the people who have been involved in this research and the development of this, they would argue vociferously and say, you're a fool to think that the D and the L taken together is equal to a bioidentical ketone. I don't think you're a fool. And Dominique D'Agostino, who's a, a big researcher, I think he's pretty much at the center of the ketogenic movement, uh, University of South Florida. He helped develop the first exogenous ketone. It was a ketone salt. And he worked with Patrick Arnold, who's out of uh, Indiana, actually and is big into the supplement industry, especially for athletes. And they worked together to come up with the first ketone salt, and that was back in 2014. And that was Keto Sports, or Keto Kana. But Keto Sports was the name of the company. So you can take those, and you, what would you see? I think if you had particular medical conditions, as we talked about before, and I'll get into a second, that, yeah, by all means, take them. If you're a regular person looking for something spectacular to change in your life, uh, it's not going to happen. And what you'll find is people are going to want this miracle to maybe not have an appetite or maybe to have a great boost in their workouts or maybe to have an intense mental focus because they have to study. Those claims are not without their grain of truth, but you'll have to find out for yourself and you realize that it's, I don't see it's there. And also it will fade. And also they're caloric. So you're actually having more calories to get into instant ketosis. We talked about, okay, does it matter what kind of ketone body you have? We talked about the DNL, and I'll leave it at that. I think we covered that. You know, how did they come about? Well, in many ways, how did these exogenous ketones come about? They came about 
because there's a big market out there. And by the way, there are plenty of pharmaceutical companies dying to be the next bioidentical ketone or to improve upon the ketone salts. I mean, they it's a raging market that has just jumped out of nowhere less than five years ago, if not less than three years ago. So it's huge. The world has changed a lot. So uh, there's a lot of players in this and there's a lot of deep pockets in here wanting to develop what they want to do. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that just because there's a lot of publicity on it doesn't mean uh, that it's necessary. So it's it's kind of like aspirin in the sense of you really got to convince everybody they have a headache so you can sell your aspirin. So if you don't have a headache, you really don't have any need for aspirin. Perhaps oversimplified, but you get my point. Okay, now that you know what ketones are helpful in many ways, for example, brain and neurologic health, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, ALS, Alzheimer's, to helping anyone achieve sustained focus, weight loss, altitude sickness, cancer, achieve greater workouts, and so on. If you put that in a pill, do you think that there's a market for this? So where the market for the mental focus and sustained energy, not so much the weight loss, is, is in the military. So where the military actually funded both the development of the ketone salts with Dominique D'Agostino and the development of the exogenous ketone ester because they would like their military to have sustained mental focus. And with, and so it, it plays perfectly there. It's basically a, a soldier is a professional athlete in this, that sense. Out on patrol, you want them to be clear-minded, not sleepy, not hungry. You know, they can take care of themselves when they come back to after their mission is over. How do they compare to achieve nutritional ketosis through diet? So how do exogenous ketones compare through nutritional ketosis through diet? Not necessarily better and often not as good. And a lot of the data, by the way, there isn't reams and reams and reams of data. It's just data for the most part by the company that has manufactured these. And these being the ketone esters in this case, there's plenty of, I wouldn't say there's plenty, there's a fair amount of research on the ketone salts by non-investors. And so it's a little more uh, objective. And the question comes, well, how do they compare to caprylic acid triglycerides? Sort of let that cat out of the bag early on. Caprylic acid triglyceride takes about 15 minutes to be converted into ketones from your liver. So you can't say it's immediate, but it's pretty darn fast. And the studies, which I have put links in on the documents that's in our Facebook group to the studies on both the exogenous ketones, the ketone salts, you'll see there's the, they talk about the bump up in ketones. So the bump up was from one to three and a half. It's like, and because I read that study, this is now a couple of months ago, I think it's only came out, if it's been out that long. And I thought, well, what am I missing here? Because my blood ketones are a lot higher and I know other people's blood ketones are a lot higher. And that's just on the nutritional ketogenic diet. So I uh, wrote to uh, a colleague, a column. It's actually a, a scientist in Canada who focuses on fatty acids, saturated fatty acids for the brain. And I said, you know, I think C8 triglyceride is actually more ketogenic than the exogenous ketones. He agreed. He says there's not a lot of data on this right now. It's all anecdotal. So that's as far as that conversation went and goes. But we'll see. For some of you in our group, you realize that we may have a shot at actually doing a study on C8 triglycerides, mouse, and then we'll correlate it to a human study. We're not going to pay for a human study. It's too expensive. But we'll have volunteers in our group to at least come up with a number of anecdotal stories over a period of a week or so following a dosing regime to have our own answer. So, and that's kind of my belief in life. If there's something that you can map out for yourself, get your own data on yourself, then that is the answer. Don't let a commercial interest talk you out of something you can do for yourself. If I sound like a, a total hard ass, sorry for that word, and that you can do this through diet, it's because you can do this through diet. I don't have really any other interest in that other than I, looking back over 16 years of clinical practice as a naturopath, I was so tired of bogus research coming out behind some drug and the pharmaceutical companies and it just didn't pan out. And then of course, 15 years later, 10 years later, five years later, they said, oh, no, actually, uh, that wasn't true. So I'm not saying exogenous ketones are not phenomenal and really interesting. I'm saying they're just not, for the most part, they're not necessary for hardly anybody. So who would benefit most from taking exogenous ketones? Individuals with medical conditions. 
think of any condition where it is perceived that a ketogenic diet is too difficult. Now, that's how loose terms. Even though I disagree with this idea that a ketogenic diet is too difficult, given my experience with our products, C8 uh, triglycerides, let me say these would be the top of the list of conditions that would probably be most easily benefit from exogenous ketones, Alzheimer's, dementia in general, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury. There's a good example. Somebody from a football player or car accident or a bicycle accident, you know, they're not going to get on a ketogenic diet. They then would want ketones as soon as possible. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's an alternative fuel for the brain. And you'd want that immediately. It would, it would be a big, big, big deal for the traumatic brain injury, TBI. ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, MS, elite athletes talked about that. A reminder of the evolution of ketogenic diet. So the ketogenic diet, I went, you know, we did a couple podcasts on the, the evolution and the history of the ketogenic diet and epilepsy. And last time we covered four years of the development of the ketogenic diet. And I hope you remember that the ketogenic diet was actually made by the two of the three specialists in the United States at the time for diabetes. They were diabetic doctors and they had been working on a diabetic diet for type one diabetes called the Allen diet, which was low to no carbs and uh, calorie restricted. It's a pretty tough diet. And what they did find is that the type 1 diabetics, pediatrics, children, did not die after one year. They died after five or six years of secondary causes, which was starvation because you couldn't stay and you know, be calorie restricted for your whole life. So it wasn't uh, a bed of roses, but they found that low carbs was a big deal. So from that diabetic diet, insulin was developed in 1921. And so after insulin was developed, obviously all the type 1 diabetics took that. They didn't have to worry about the the diet, thank goodness. But that diet then moved from diabetes into epilepsy with the change that it didn't have to be calorie restricted. It was just carbs. So you see the evolution there? So that's what that was about. That's pretty interesting. So the idea, and this is important, and the idea of reducing blood glucose and therefore insulin levels and inflammation, when that is the issue, dropping glucose, dropping insulin, dropping inflammation, when that plays a bigger role than the presence of ketones, then taking exogenous ketones really aren't helpful. So what do I mean by that? If you stop, so how do you drop glucose, drop insulin levels, and you will be dropping inflammation as well? The ways you do that is either starving or fasting, right? You're not eating anything. And so your body interprets that as, well, we do have then we have to learn how to have access here. We do have access to fats, our own fats, and we do have access when push comes to shove to some protein. But we are never going to have access to carbohydrates. It can't make carbohydrates. It can make some glucose from protein, but that's as far as it can go. So that's how your body says fasting, starving, that's what that's about. It's a no carb situation. So in order to drop your glucose, you basically stop having carbs, either fasting, starve, or no carb diet. That's what that is. That's the glucose part. So your body automatically starts gradually becoming more and more efficient at creating ketones from the fats. But in terms of a primary beneficial effect that you're trying to create for a particular condition, and these particular conditions would be this, would be epilepsy. If you drop the sugar, drop the insulin, for the most part, you'll be dropping their, the frequency of your seizure episodes, perhaps to zero. Also, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's, in my word, is, and many people, it's basically a variation of diabetes. It's a blood sugar problem. So when you remove the blood sugar part, and yes, that person's going to be making ketones consequently, but it's more of an issue of dropping the sugar and dropping the insulin. You'll find their fertility returns and all of the, some of their other side effects. GERDs, which is a gastrointestinal, it's basically heartburn, if you will. That's changed by dropping the insulin, dropping the sugar, not necessarily by increasing the ketones. Obesity, obesity again. So it's dropping insulin, dropping the sugar is a primary uh, factor to making obesity better, to losing weight. The ketones secondarily. Type 2 diabetes, metabolic disease, they're all pretty much the same thing. Okay, whereas in other conditions, when you are actually now looking at so we talked about lowering blood sugar and lowering insulin as the primary focus. 
Whereas in other conditions, the primary focus is elevation of ketones because we really need to have this alternative fuel. So in what conditions do we need to have this alternative fuel pretty much as the, as the driver for the overall improvement of this particular condition? And so they would be, they would be pretty much the ones that I already named, your Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, TBI, ALS, MS. Interesting, even for speaking of neurological conditions, even tremors, intentional and unintentional tremors improve with this as well. So for the less dramatic issue of, all right, if I apply ketones, to what other conditions for the average person? Would it help with weight loss? Would it help with mental focus? Would it help with altitude sickness? Um, the answer is yes, yes, yes. It's the alternative fuel. And it actually, you know, we've talked about this before, but when you are burning ketones, so when ketones are your primary fuel, that you are then actually using less oxygen. So you get more bang for your buck, okay? So that means that you could be in an environment which has less oxygen and do quite well. So that's why it's good for altitude sickness. It clearly is better to be on a ketogenic diet if you're actually going to go and be a rock climber or uh, out west. Mount Rainier has base camp at 10,000 feet and it goes up to about another four or 5,000 feet after that. Most people didn't make it to base camp because it was too high and the air was too thin. So for those who are on a ketogenic diet, could easily just walk right on through. So you're getting more work per unit of oxygen consumed. And therefore, the corollary of that is you could be in an environment that has less oxygen and either sustain longer. So you can hold your breath longer underwater when you're on a ketogenic diet and or with ketones. So interesting. Okay, what are the comparative costs for these exogenous ketones on a monthly basis? So let's assume in the pretend world that we're going to have some standard dose. I didn't write out what the standard dose would be, but I came up with an approximate. I could do this. This is not, I just didn't want to get that deep into the details. Ketone salts, all the ones that are sold on Amazon, that would run you anywhere from two to $400 a month. Ketone esters are exorbitantly expensive. That would run you anywhere from $2,500 to $3,000 a month. You have to pay, uh, it's $33 per dose. So a dose would last you, I think it might be a couple hours. You can check the back of the package and then it fades. So you would need at least three doses a day. So at a minimum, if not, if you're, if you're talking about staying into ketosis. Um, so three a day, it's 100 a day times 30 days. There's your $3,000. More than likely, it would be a lot more than that. Caprylic acid triglyceride, it's getting to be a, uh, an old saw, isn't it? That would be about $40 a month. So, you know, do you want to go natural or not? You want to be part of the trend or not? Do you have a medical reason to do this or not? So let's go back a little more. So the first exogenous ketone was created in 2014. I mentioned that was between Dominique. Actually, Dominique called Patrick Arnold. And I've talked to both of these guys, and I know both these guys, from Keto Sports, and they did famously well. And now there's plenty others, so they no longer have the corner of the market, but they did well for a while. But the reason for Dom doing this is that he actually had a topic as his undergraduate. It's an interesting story that his topic for his undergrad was possibly was, was to cat while, while Navy SEAL were on their mix, that is their rebreather apparatus, so they can go down 50 feet and not make any bubbles and stealthily cross underwater or stay hidden or do whatever they do. But without bubbles, they had to be on this mix. And so they had a lot of oxygen. It was obviously a high percentage of oxygen. And so they would suffer oxygen toxicity. So, and they would have seizures. Obviously not a good thing underwater. So he then thought about, well, maybe we could use the treatment they're using for epilepsy to treat these oxygen toxicity. So that was a great thesis, and he worked with mice. He would take mice basically under greater and greater pressure and change the percent of oxygen, so he'd replicate those conditions. And um, that's why the original exogenous ketone salts were made, and it proved him right. It's very helpful. Also to say that the exogenous ketone esters were also funded NIH grant, mostly by the Department of Defense. I want to bring you up to something I've mentioned before, that there were two rowing teams. So what does this have to do with exogenous ketones? Well, you answer that, and I'll just tell you the story. So in 2014, in August 2014, there was a husband and wife team that was going to challenge the two-man rowing from Monterey, California to Hawaii, and that was Sami Inkinen and his wife, 
and they approached Stephen Finney, who had been working with athletes on the ketogenic diet, and they made. He was very reluctant to get involved with Sami. Apparently, Sami was kind of pushy, but uh, obviously, they worked together and they made uh, 60-day supplies, uh, ketogenic supplies. And the name of the boat was called Fat Chance. Uh, Sami wanted to do a sugar-free. I don't know if they were carb-free. But anyway, he beat the 60-day record by 15 days, he and his wife. That's phenomenal. Not only that, when they arrived, they weren't tired. They were stronger for the event. Go figure. Again, that was repeated slightly differently in this just two months ago. Where are we two months ago? No, just a month ago in January, there were four men that... Uh, there's another competition from the Canary Islands to Antigua in the Caribbean. So they call that crossing the Atlantic. And that was a 3,000 mile trip. And they did it in five, they beat the record in five days. And they were strictly focused on what they call an MCT diet. And an exogenous ketone company called Prove It sponsored them. That's as much as I know about that. So you can guess that exogenous ketones and the MCT diet helped them a lot. So the exogenous ketone ester is called HVMN, and you can look that up, and you can sort of see a few research publications have come out on that. It was an NIH grant that started in 2006, and it's now just produced its first product. It's amazing. That's 12 years from inception to market. So this study demonstrates the efficacy and tolerability of oral exogenous ketone supplementation in inducing nutritional ketosis independent of di- dietary restrictions. So what they want is they want everybody to take this. You go take this. You don't need to think about anything in your life. And I told you we're, we have an affiliation, I should say, with the Charlie Foundation. And they used to have a nice post about how exogenous ketones were not something that they were interested in getting involved with for their uh, treating their epilepsy. For one, the expense was huge. And the state of ketosis can easily be created by various forms of diet. There's another diet on the metabolism of exogenous ketones in humans. You can read that. And one of the key points that come out of that, that comes out of that, is that it lowers the hormone for appetite. So one of the reasons the everyday person who doesn't have any particular medical condition might want to consider using this, and I say might, yeah, this is a pretty expensive thing, is to use it as an appetite, appetite suppressant. So if you're trying to lose weight and you're one way you're thinking about, oh, if I just suppress my appetite forever, I'll lose calories. In other words, if you want to induce starvation, if you want to induce fasting for a long period of time to, u- to lose calories, lose pounds, this would help you with that. But let me also say any ketogenic diet that produces ketones will also help suppress, I don't like that word, lower your ghrelin, that's the hormone, so ghrelin. You want high ghrelin levels because that tells your brain that you've had a big meal. So any ketogenic diet will do that. If you're not ketogenic and you need to suppress your appetite, you can try either exogenous ketones. But long-term, I would suggest thinking about a natural approach, not just because it's cheaper, because it's more effective. Okay, there is a interesting podcast, a portion it's about exogenous ketones. It was Ben Greenfield interviewing Dominique Agostino. So uh, if you don't see this document in the Facebook group, just go Google it and you'll find that out. And at at minute 26, I'd start at minute 25, you'll hear uh, Dom talk about the value of MCT oils in terms of being ketogenic and C8 in particular. I think for the most part, I wanted to end with this particular thought, to put all that I talked about in a slightly different perspective, and I'm going to say it this way. A fatty acid, a ketone, and a glucose molecule come into a bar, and that bar is you. So what does that mean? It means your body will always be using fatty acids as a source of energy. Ketones are the thing that goes to your mitochondria. Glucose also is a fuel that goes to your mitochondria. So they both go to the same factory. They're both energy-producing cells in your body. And that's the way it's always going to be. We're not changing any of that. These are the forms of energy in your body. They will always be that way. A ketogenic diet obviously increases your BHP. And I won't say it decreases your glucose, but it 
reduces the need for glucose. And therefore, that's why diabetics and all these other conditions benefit by being on a ketogenic diet. Their need for glucose is a lot less. Um, the interesting thing about caprylic acid, it's an eight carbon fatty acid. And BHB is a four carbon. And so some people think, well, the reason that C8, caprylic acid triglyceride, is so efficient, it simply is cleaved off. You know, it's a twofer. You get two BHB for one molecule. It's pretty much that way. It's a little more complicated than that. But the point is, you're always going to be needing this. And, and in terms of using fats, fats are triglycerides in your body. And so when your fatty acids are clipped off to then be made into ketones, ketone bodies, that stem that they come from, so triglycerides like the letter E, that backbone, they say it's a glycerol backbone, that's immediately used for in the future, stored and used in the future as making future glucose. So they call that gluconeogenesis. So you'll always be having a mix of ketones and glucose. For generations, the last few generations that have been a very high carb generation, they've been nearly always having glucose and very little in the way of ketones. This is now starting to change and it's an amazing change uh, for all of us. So I'd like to end there and I hope this was helpful in letting you know that yes, there is a valuable reason for exogenous ketones. For the most part, if I was at a quiz show, I'd say they're a hellacious waste of money. However, they are acutely necessary in a few particular medical conditions and, of course, if you're willing to pay to being an elite athlete. But I would say if you're taking things to give you that edge, where does that ever stop? How is that different than, you know, I know it's a natural thing, so we're taking a natural thing that's been made synthetically, but I always think about, all right, taking something that somebody else isn't taking and you've got a better time. Does that make you a better athlete? I've always been a little confused with that. But anyways, it's out there and they're doing it and they have wonderful results. And that's how that goes. So decide for yourself. I hope this has been helpful. I put some references down there, both for the studies and the podcasts uh, for you to follow up yourself. Take care. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy week after week. Thank you.